Hi, everyone. Today, I'm joined by John Verveke. John is a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto, uh, creator of the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis YouTube series, and now after Socrates. Uh, really, uh, no need for introduction uh, in this case for most of the people watching this, um, but really uh, appreciate you having uh, or ha you know taking the time to uh, come on this podcast, John. Uh, I'd love to explore some things around Neoplatonism and cognitive science and whatnot. Um, but yeah, before we dive into that, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Appreciate it. Oh, it's it, it's it's great being here, Brendan. Um, I've really enjoyed the uh, the stuff we did in the past, you and I and Layman, and I just want to keep uh, I just keep uh, I I want to keep uh, helping lift you into the limelight. You're doing good work, and oh, I think uh, some of the themes uh, are really important uh, uh, to trying to help people uh, respond to what's happening today in a in a more uh, uh, adaptive mm -hmm. and, and fulfilling manner. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, just a great pleasure. Cool. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that too. And yes, uh, yeah, our, our conversation about artfully scaling to religion is not a religion was really enjoyable. And uh, so, I mean, gosh, there's so much we could get into. Um, but uh, what I want to zoom in, I, we've got some limited time today, so I'd love to just zoom in on this, um, which is uh, uh, you, you gave this incredible presentation at um, Ralston College called Levels of Intelligibility, uh, Neoplatonism and Fourier Cognitive yeah. Science. And yeah. for me, this just really stood out as being like, wow. I mean, I've literally watched this three times now. I've kind of digested it a lot. And um, and I also think that especially with what the work that you're doing now with After Socrates and kind of where this is going and uh, bringing in this uh, conversation around Neoplatonism and this kind of perennial tradition, the, the lingua franca of sort of the, uh, yeah, yeah uh, kind of philosophical, contemplative, mystical traditions, uh, bridging East and West, that sort of a thing. And how important that is in this kind of wisdom famine, meaning crisis uh so um yeah what i wanted to explore specifically though is because uh, you know i think that given the kind of environment around meaning we tend to uh in this space i mean the sort of meta modern ecosystem i think sort of naturally just say neoplat neoplatonism great wisdom traditions great mysticism great and we don't necessarily focus as much on um what are the updates that are going on here yeah. uh, what are the changes what are the differences so one of the things i wanted to explore up front was um just to kind of pose the question to you so obviously so you describe yourself as a zen neoplatonist at least that's how you kind of <laughs> mention yourself at the uh, beginning of this uh, presentation. But I guess I wanted to open up by asking you, what do you think the ancients missed? Uh, what what is what can we bring to um, in our own time, these inherited traditions that might be really meaningful updates? I mean, you talk about, um, you know, it's a kind of the same worldview that you're presenting through this cog sci framework, but quote unquote, uh, with development for the scientific age. Um, mm. so yeah, broadly speaking, can you, I mean, what are some things that you would say, you know, uh, it, it's not your, your grandfather's Neoplatonism. What, what is different <laughs> about it? Maybe my great, great, great grandfather. <laughs> um, yeah. So what's different about it? I often, um, I often will put the adjective post-nominalist, uh, and that's very broadly construed. Um, the idea that, um, there, we need new arguments and and probably to some degree new practices or at, at least exaptations of old practices uh because there have been uh you know there has been significant uh scientific uh, development of course we're way beyond the original uh, uh Aristotelian science that was drawn into neoplatonism um and contrary to what people think, there is genuine progress in philosophy. It just works at a different pace and a different scope. Um, and we've had the entire analytic and continental traditions that we can't simply ignore. Uh, and um, and then we, there's something you already uh, uh, alluded to. We're in a pluralistic world uh, in which Neoplatonism needs to be brought into a conversation with other great uh uh, synoptic integration. So Neoplatonism is, I sort of joke, it's the grand unified field theory of mm -hmm. uh, uh, of uh, the uh, of the you know the Western so-called uh, wisdom traditions. When when I say West, I include the Islamic world. Uh, I want to be very clear about that. So I, I I'm sort of moving towards uh, stopping calling it the Western world and calling it sort of the Abrahamic world, if uh, the world that uh, you know that comes out of the Abrahamic. Uh, uh, traditions uh, and so uh that 
has an equivalent. There is something that synthesized, you know, uh, profound forms of Mahayana Buddhism, uh, uh, Chinese Taoism, and, and uh, elements from Japanese Shinto uh, into Zen. And so Zen is also another great synthesis. And so, um, and 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 there's a, therefore a, I think, proper responsibility of Neoplatonism to enter into a reciprocal realization with Zen and vice versa. And of course, that is not something I have proposed de novo. Uh, the Kyoto School uh, mm -hmm. took that task up, that challenge up in a powerful way. Um, and uh, some of the greatest thinkers, I mean, I think I always say Nishitani's Religion and Nothingness is one of the top five books I've studied in my life. Um, so there's, I would say that the challenges of responding to the genuine histor historical developments in uh, philosophy, science, and the confrontation with equally pertinent and powerful um, synoptic integrations yeah. uh, means Neoplaton has to, Neoplatonism has to be different than it was then. Yeah. Well, and to zero in on maybe some of the philosophical element of this, because, um, you know, you talk about the two worlds mythology that comes out yes. of the axial age and whatnot. And um, one of the things that has always sort of troubled me or hasn't sat well with me as a modern, postmodern, metamodern person or whatever you want to call that is um, when I read in some of the Neoplatonic literature, some of the that two worlds kinds of thinking, there's yeah. a there's yes. a there's a kind yeah. of uh, asceticism that is there. Um, I know, obviously, yeah. well, I shouldn't say obviously, but uh, Plotinus, you know, critiques things like Gnosticism. He's got a whole uh, kind of track yeah. on that. So he is, uh, you know, in support of matter and in, in the uh, of the world in a way that other kind of traditions uh, were were not. Uh, at the same time, you know, there's this, I think, Porphyry in, in his life of Plotinus yeah. talks about him not wanting to sit for a bust because he's like, uh, oh, well, matter is just sort of, you know, it's it's it's. Uh, you know, what's the use of making an imitation of an imitation? It's not really very important, that sort of a thing. And so there is this kind of strain in Neoplatonic oh, thought. So, I, yeah, speak to that a little bit. Is that one of these things that we need to oh, kind yeah. of... Oh, yeah, very much. Uh, you know, uh, to go back to Porphyry, uh, uh, the opening line is something like, uh, Plotinus always behaved as someone who was ashamed that he had a yes, body. Right, right. Uh, it's like, mom. So uh, 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 this is exactly it. I mean, I think, uh, I think the best arguments... And Ralston, the, the argument at Ralston, and again, I want to uh, thank Stephen uh, for having me at Ralston uh, very much, uh, you know, Stephen Blackwood. Um, but um, uh, I think the best arguments for uh, uh, something like a Neoplatonic worldview come out of for ecog -Sci, or at least rely a, a significant leg of the argument is for ecog -Sci. and and I and I think that means. Um, challenging a lot of things that the Neoplatonists inherited from Plato. I I, I consider myself a Neoplatonist. Uh, uh, you know, the, the collected works of Plato and the collected works of Plotinus would probably be mm. two of my uh, Desert Island books mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, but there, that doesn't mean that I think everything there um, uh, should be um, uh, accepted. I, I, I agree with you. I think the two worlds mythology has to go. I think there are later Neoplatonists that start to, uh, so for me, uh, uh, Erigena in particular, um, uh, giving a, a, an ontology that is properly um, sort of one world, uh, mm -hmm. but it has got this complete, and it, it's not emanation up here and emergence down here, but it's emanation and emergence at all levels completely mm -hmm. interpenetrating each other. Um, and I think that's a revision, although I think there are relevant precursors um, like uh, Erigena in the Neoplatonic tradition, um, uh, the idea of um, a, a, a reality as um, as perfection, uh, meaning a, 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 a sense of completeness or staticness or rest, I find that very problematic because it's not conducive to all of the practices mm. that you see people engaging in. Um, and, and then again, so there you can turn to uh, the again, the Christian Neoplatonic tradition, Gregory of Nyssa's notion of epic stasis. We don't come to rest in God. God is the field affordance of our perpetual self-transcendence, which is a very different model than, than um, uh, sort of standard going to heaven and having a, an, an everlasting vacation or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
there there is um th there's the attitude towards art uh which i don't think um sits well even with plotinus's own stuff on beauty and uh into uh, an intellectual beauty it certainly doesn't sit well with plato plato has this deeply people think it's a simplistic relationship but plato has this deeply and I, I I like to use a Greek word like tonos, this tension, this creative tension uh, with art. Uh, he you know he condemns the poet and then uses all kinds of poetry, and mm -hmm. he condemns the myth and then writes all kinds of myths. And there's this weird. It's easy, and I, I think for somebody like Plato, especially under the influence of Socrates, that's not just sort of ignorant performative contradic uh, performative contradiction. I think there's a deep uh, a deep thing going on there, um, and so. Uh, I think all of that, um, I I also reject in Neoplatonism. I think that embodiment uh, is, is crucial, um, um, and and this is you know this is where Zen, especially if you recover the Taoist dimensions of Zen and the aesthetic dimensions of Zen, which are are quite rich, it can can counterbalance those tendencies in Neoplatonism uh, to a significant degree. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of updates going on in some ways. And I, I think that, I think it's good to foreground that I think, cause I think some people also from the outside can look in and be like, well, wait a second, is this just sort of like a, uh, kind of a perennialist tradition that's seeing a resurgence without in it kind of, obviously it's, it's not uncritical yeah. in that sense, but it's, uh, you know, trying to regain this deeply valuable framework, um, but also being aware of, yeah, some limitations of the past, I think, uh, and, and trying to, I mean, even, you know, Plotinus is talking about Plato as though this is what Plato said, but of course it's really yes. what Plotinus is saying about Plato. So I feel like the Neoplatonic tradition sort of inherently has this thing of like, we'll call it this, but it's always this continually adapting uh, kind of a dynamic uh, lineage that's really like drawing on tradition for inspiration and but continuing to sort of develop it. And in that sense, I guess you could just say it's Neoplatonism uh, in the old sense, but uh, there's a lot, there's a lot that's also different about it. Um, well, uh, another question too. So Digging into some of this, uh, uh, the fascinating comparisons you make in this presentation between, you know, the Neoplatonic sort of cosmology or map of the world and the kind of uh, map of the psyche in some ways, or the map of, map of yeah. yeah, let's just call it the map of the psyche as sort of Coxeye is revealing it. Um, it. It raises some very interesting questions and associations. Uh, and I think this will tie into what we've just been talking about because so in the Neoplatonic tradition, the one is this like the ultimate kind of attractor. It's the the great kind of, um, yeah. you know, uh, teleological aim. Um, what I get from your presentation is that you're articulating that as almost like abstraction uh, itself, like the ultimate abstraction. Uh, uh, and that, you know, you, you mentioned we do this thing of we're, we kind of do the particularization. We find the the specifics in this continual sort of predictive processing thing where uh, we're attuned yeah. to, you know, what's yeah. not kind of matching our inferences and whatever. And then we're, yeah. and then the brain is sort of, you know, uh, predicting itself at m lower levels. Um, but you seem to, this seems to lead to increasing levels of abstraction. And you talk about the wanting of reality being yeah. when we come yeah. up with ideas and we're wanting them and that sort of a thing. So I'm getting the impression that in, in this correlation, uh, the one is somehow kind of, you know, abstraction in, in, in the ultimate in some ways. Uh, is that, yeah. So, uh, uh um, um, sort sort of a gentle no. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, um, not because that's wrong, but it, I think it's incomplete in a yeah. way that could be misleading. Yeah. I think uh, the one is both uh, the ultimate, um, and and this is this is very much Ergina in contrast to Plotinus, right? Uh, but the one is also the ground from which all of the emergence mm -hmm. uh, uh, springs. Uh, so I'm only going to use this as an analogy. I'm mm -hmm. not pinning this as a direct ontological claim, but you could think of the one as the oneness of the quantum realm from which everything emerges. Mm -hmm. And then also the oneness of sort of the cosmological relativistic scale uh, against which everything is top down constrained. Um, uh, and so uh, and I would think, and the attempts, um, uh, to integrate those two have been, of course, very, very challenging. Uh, I, I, I now I want I make a again. I'm not a physicist, 
but I am a person who studies problem solving very deeply. I think the fact that the, they've tried to solve this problem for so long and, and it just had repeated failures, they perhaps should take a meta stance and step back and ask, what are we, why are we continuing to fail? Instead of just doing theory after theory, step back and try and notice there must be some presuppositions shared amongst all the failed theories that we're not willing mm. to challenge. Mm. And I think one of the presuppositions is that the ultimate explanation has to be completely bottom up. Um, and I think that is very, very problematic. So for me, the one is simultaneously the ground from which everything emerges and also the canopy, if I can use an, a, an opposite metaphor, mm -hmm. uh, under which everything is constrained. Now, is this, uh, yes, yeah, so this is really good and rich. So is this something that is uh, conceivable? Or once you start thinking in these terms, do you kind of get into this sort of um, apophatic paradox? And you're like, how can the ground of being also be the apex? You know, like, is, is this yeah. intelligible, I guess, to use, you know, the, the well, word? Well, well, this is where the uh, another person, um, so there's Zero G, and, I, and, and by the way, for those of you who are watching after Socrates, we're going to be up to uh, Eregina and Nicholas of Cusa very soon. Mm. Um, and so um, this is where Cusa comes in, which is that when we try to uh, push uh, uh, the the limits of uh, of intelligibility, we start to get into, you know, the coincidence of the opposites uh, as we try to relate uh, infinity and, fi and finiteness together. Um, and, and and this is where this is where I think perhaps the Neoplatonic tradition peak could be of service to Zen. Um, I hope the Zen people are are, are as open hearted um, to this as um, the 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 some of the individuals I talked to about. And this is that the idea that when you move to that place where you're trying to wrestle with the the. The, the 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 simultaneous ground and canopy of being and being intelligible and um uh, sort of where the, the the simultaneous ground of knowing and being uh and the simultaneous canopy of knowing and being um and then the simultaneity between them right um you it's very you you start to press against what um must in itself be unintelligible because it is the source of intelligibility, um, both our ability to know and the ability of things to be known. Um, and the danger here is to slip into sloppy sloppiness, the sloppy anti-intellectual, pseudo-intellectual, pseudo-philosophical bullshit. Um, now, I want to be really clear. I'm not claiming that this is you know, uh, essential to the Zen tradition or anything like that. But um, there's definitely Zen uh, currents, I'll try to use the neutral, that tend in this way, in a way that's really detrimental to the fact, I think the undeniable fact that science gets at reality in a really profound way that, that has to be integrated with Zen. And you either get a kind of anti-intellectual dismissivism or that it's just irrelevant. It's like, no, if like uh, science is a very, very, very powerful way of overcoming self-deception. I, I get it. Uh, Zen is a very, very powerful way of overcoming self-deception, but they need to be brought into proper relationship. Mm -hmm. And so what Neoplatonism says is, right, you never just leap into um, the unintelligible the no thingness um you always uh, you always do this tremendous um philosophical work both uh theoretical and spiritual um and only from there and always in dialogue from there do you uh, do you enter into relationship unification henosis whatever you want to call it with the one this is a very different thing uh, and this is to pick up on the platonic idea that you not only ascend out of the cave to see the sun, you have to be able to return back to the depths of the cave mm. in a proper manner. Yeah. Uh, and D.C. Schindler just makes a, an astonishingly powerful argument for this in Plato's Critique of Impure Reason. Mm. If the absolute does not properly include the relative, it is not the absolute. Mm. Um, right? And uh, And so 
for me, um, yeah, that's how I want to answer that. I, it, it, it's a really careful, tricky thing. And and one of the advantages I see in Neoplatonism is it keeps the tonos b- between those really properly proportioned. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the overemphasis of the ascent as being one of the problematic aspects of sort of the, the, the tradition of Neoplatonism. Uh, and, and that was, that's one of the things that I grapple with about all this is what does it mean to integrate both the ascent and the descent? And then it seems like these converge ultimately to this recognition that they, <laughs> they converge towards the same thing, uh, yes. in the sense that as the ground of being and the canopy kind of become one. Um, I want to, let's see, there's so many ways to kind of, kind of unpack that a little bit. One of my questions about all this too is, um, you know, it does have to do with sort of orientation uh, at a kind of pragmatic level in praxis, uh, you know, how one lives and what one orients oneself towards. Um, because uh, it raises the question of like, <laughs> You know, again, these are these are metaphorical mappings, right? But it's sort of like, what direction yeah. do we should we be again orienting to? Uh, yeah. Should it be uh, primarily to uh, think about moving in the direction of yeah, trying to find the greater uh, unity in things, uh, or should it be more towards kind of is is descent moving into the particularity of things, um, and and somehow bringing these two things together? Uh, one way of maybe framing this would be this, um, you know. Know, I'm really interested in complexification and the idea of yes, the, yeah, the role that yeah, complexity yeah. plays. And I think that you can do some very uh, meaningful mapping of uh, this sort of platonic ascent through a kind of complexification ascent. And, totally. Yes, yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, and you even talk about the levels of reality in the self. And, and when you compare that to the work of, say, like uh, Greg Enriquez and what he's shown about yeah, the mind, yeah, yeah, complexify- yeah. complexifying or Bobby Azarian's work, there's a very clear way that these things can also map that way. But then there's this implication that like, okay, so more complexity is better. More complexity will take you to the one uh, or something like that. So, but, but I also, it seems like we need to be maybe disabused of that, that there's, it's, it's more complex than that or something in the sense that maybe moving uh, in that direction needs to be counterbalanced by this descending. So I don't know, can you speak to some of that? Yeah, very much so. And this is where like Zen Neoplatonism, especially if it's understood as, uh, as a, and as an explicit and accepted and acknowledged and appreciated opponent processing right at the heart of a framework, rather than finding it sort of showing up implicitly. Um, and of course, you know, all the arguments I have around opponent, why the importance of opponent processing. Um, I think that, the, you know, Neoplatonism emphasizes, um, it emphasizes the integration um, and then the suchness of Zen emphasizes the absolute differentiation mm. um, and like getting the two to constantly resonate with each other seems to me to be optimal uh, for getting an optimal grip on reality to get the pro- the internal processes of complexification to dynamically and in an evolving manner conform more and more to the way reality is complexifying. That's, mm. to me, the project. And like I said, um, the way, the, like the, the 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 emphasis on integration and the emphasis on differentiation, um, um, and then they both sort of have a, a meeting place on the importance of relationality and that relations are real, if not more real than any sort of spatio-temporal objects. The fact that physics, by the way, is mer- is moving towards clumsily, by the way, um, in terms of of, of of its philosophical discourse, uh, but uh, but moving towards the idea that space and time are themselves emergent properties, mm. and then trying to somehow, you know, just uh, you know, Descartes, and Newton would, are like spinning in their graves <laughs> because the idea that. Uh, and, and the way it's being talked about is if the emergence of space and time is merely something generated by our mind, and that puts the mind in this really weird uh, uh, ontological space. But, you know, space and time are supposed to be the things that were definitional of objectivity, right? And 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 so, um, yeah, I, 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 that, but that that emphasis on, right, that that emphasis on the the the, the like there's there there are two ways in which things are are like beyond their their 
thinginess. <laughs> like when I get to the suchness of this, and you can you can feel the Zen in this, I'm trying to get at what is not categorical about this, what, how this is not a bottle, mm. it's not a human instrument. I'm trying to get to its suchness. I'm trying mm. to get how it is, mm. right, for, for and in itself. And Schindler argues that this is actually Plato's conception of what sort of the good is. The, the giving of reality is that complete for itself, uh, its suchness, right? And then, of course, you've got the Neoplatonic claim that, well, this isn't a thing because it's participating in principles, right, uh, uh, that it, that are, are also being participated in many other places and many other times. And so you, you see that moreness and then you see the suchness and you're trying to, and they're both non-categorical. They both require um, a non-thingy way <laughs> what, a, what a putting it a non thingy way of trying to change your perspectival and participatory knowing of the uh, of reality yeah. sorry did that help as an answer yeah somewhat i mean i we'll, we'll probably weave this in in a second uh because one of the things just to stick on this issue of complexity too i wanted to ask you about is um you know uh I'm curious about what you make of the role of narrative uh, in in the yes. meaning crisis, let's say, broadly yes. speaking. But to like narrow in specifically what I mean by that is, um, you know, obviously, it, it, specifically in a kind of Western Judeo, or let's just say Abrahamic, to use that term, yeah. uh, uh, religious tradition, narrative was crucial. We're talking about sacred yes. texts. We're talking about myths and that sort of a thing. Um, and a lot of the the work that's been coming out of um, people engaging with the issue of the meaning crisis is very praxis based. It's very uh, yeah. ecologies of practices and, and this sort of a thing. Deeply, deeply important. But that always leaves me asking, well, what about the story? What about the the narrative component? Yeah. So I wanted to just ask you, do you think um, that complexity and this complexification narrative that seems to be emerging increasingly in uh, these uh, domains of uh, uh, the sciences, but also getting picked up, you know, increasingly in the broader culture. Do you think something like that could be uh, a helpful framing narrative for, you know, to something that you could kind of relate then to the Neoplatonic framework that you could relate the four Ecoxi to and relate the spiritual practice to, but but set it in sort of a, a grand arcing sweep epic of history of Big Bang. You know, you get something like a creation story, an origin story with, you know, wherever the, the universe came from. And then there's this complexification through time. Um, how does that sit with you? Do you find that too problematic? or do you think that that could be uh, helpful I, I think it's very helpful um uh, I, I, and um <laughs> it's i mean uh i'm i'm worried about being too pretentious uh, my hope is that with uh, with many other people doing a lot of great work um we, we can create a plausible sort of psychoontology like we've been d d mm -hmm. discussing here and then that psychoontology will properly have two dimensions to it, a vertical dimension, which we've been emphasizing here, mm -hmm. the emergence emanation dimension, but it also will have a horizontal develop, you know, uh, uh, dimension, the, the, the dimension of development, because compl it, complexification relies on uh, dynamics, self-organization, autopoetic <laughs> systems, and in autopoetic systems, their function and their history are, you can't pull them apart. They function as they do by developing and they develop by functioning. Um, and, and so um, the, 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 there's an, inher an inherent horizontal um, dimension to this. And then, of course, there's a weird, uh, to strain the metaphor a bit, there's a diagonal relationship between them. And one of the things that narrative does is put those two dimensions into play mm. and interrelate them. Uh, you always have a vertical dimension you know character is one of them and and, thing, and then of course you have plot and so there's character and plot um and then there's thematic arcs that are supposed to link the two together and uh, and then narrative is also indispensable and i'll keep saying this because people oh, verveki is hostile to narrative no he's not right verveki just thinks the proposal of seeing reality um that the that the deepest frame or the final frame is narrative i i i question that uh, but narrative is it's is essential to uh training us so that we can be temporally extended moral agents that are capable of mind sight of each other and all of this is needed for genuine dialectic into dialogos yeah. uh, and so insofar as it's doing all of that 
right? Insofar as it's giving us a vertical and a horizontal that are diagonally interpenetrating um, and self-organizing. Uh, and, and insofar as it's teaching us how to pick up on other people's mental states, Hudo's narrative practice hypothesis, um, I think something like a narrative is coming out of this. But I would say it's also going to be unlike previous narrative. Mm. Um, and this is maybe How the so? struggle. Yeah, well, this is maybe the struggle. So for me, in talking about narrative, um, I think these elements are definitional for narrative. Uh, I'm a, you can use narrative very loosely just to mean anything that happens that we can tell a story about, and that's uninteresting. And I'll keep repeating that. That's <laughs> uninteresting. Mm -hmm. That like like that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't like that doesn't carry any significance to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's a deeper proposal, which is reality is itself a, a, a narrative. Um, and I think narrative requires something like agency, uh, teleology, motivation, learning, problem solving. I think when you, uh, and genuine dialogue, mm -hmm. right? When you remove those from a narrative, you don't have a narrative anymore. Mm -hmm. um, now you can anthropomorphize things and do. And that's what I mean. You can do, you can turn. I can I can create a. The bottle went all along the table, and it was trying. Like I can create a story that like yeah. that. And 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 and, and it's sort of it's sort of it's pleasing to us because it 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 puts in play these powerful and important faculties. But I don't think it is appropriate. Um, to think of that vertical, horizontal, developmental, dialogical um, thing as narrative, because I think it lacks. Um, I think thinking of reality as an agent with motivations, solving problems, frustrated as it's attempting to reach its goals in conflict with other agents, needing to end, namely a mythological narrative, I don't think that ontology will support such a mythological uh, narrative in important ways. And in fact, what you need is you need important differences between the em emergence emanation going on within a cognitive agent without, because the, the proposal is they conform and they reciprocally resonate with each other, not that they form a homogenous identity. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the lack of those definitional features of narrative is what preserves the world from being just an anthropomorphic projection by us. Yeah. Sorry, that's a long point, but it's a very important point. Yeah. Um. I, there's a lot. There's a lot there. I mean, so I could I could say something. I don't know if it'll make any sense. Uh. But maybe it'll register. I was thinking about this, and it's sort of like if you try to make the story of the totality of the universe itself meaningful, it's sort of inherently impossible because meaning requires an agent arena relationship and you don't have yeah. Uh, yeah. An, an arena if it's the entire universe or something like that. Yeah, yes, um, yes. So there's an element of that. But at the same time, I think everything, those dynamics that you just named, you know, uh, teleology, problem solving, uh, the, you know, the, the things you were just getting at, agency, I, I do think you can look at the complexification story of the universe and see these things emerging. In fact, that seems to be what has emerged out of the complexification of the universe. So there's also a part of me that wants to see, maybe we don't anthropomorphize mythologically the entire evolution of the universe, but what has gone on inside of it can be an articulation of what's what we mean by this emerging uh, bottom-up uh, complexity. And I think that that can be deeply meaningful for people because it helps people frame their own lives in relationship to that. Like how am I related to the complexification of the, of the universe, which I think can be, yeah, very meaningful and, and helpful. I don't know. Well, no, I think I, I I'm in agreement with you, but, but I'll, I'll put a, a twist on it. Sure. Um, I think all of that's right, but I think narrative is, uh, narrative is properly understood ultimately as transjective um mm -hmm. and, and 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 as and imaginal um and that it it properly also affords the the, the creation of ritual uh which is also about affordances and transjectivity so i i i that's my reason for not attributing the narrative to um 
what you might call the objective world or the world disclosed by science. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but that that scientific worldview also does not really proper. And you know all the arguments about that myself and others have made about this. Mm-hmm. Doesn't really capture the transjectivity. Right. And I think right. I think the narrative does. But then what I would then say is. You need to pay attention to the fact that many, many Abrahamic and non-Abrahamic um, wisdom, religious traditions put an emphasis on a trans-narrative realization as being more important uh, to getting to that transjectivity than anything that is capable within the narrative mm. uh, framing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the, that's the second leg of my argument. So the yeah. first part of my argument is I think it's very important, um, but... Uh, but you 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 want to prevent a simple identity of within and without. You you want participation, and then that leads you to the transjectivity argument, and then that leads to the idea that um, the realization of non-duality is actually the fullest realization of the transjectivity beyond the narrative. Yeah. So okay, that's a great. Say. I wanted to ask about this too. Um, so. The way I think about this, and I love, the, I think transjective, that word does a lot of work. It's very helpful. And we think about meaning as arising out of, um, you know, that agent arena relationship, that transjective yep, yep. relationship, I, meaning I, things only have meaning to me in relationship to my environment. And I'm going to be, yeah. you know, working on stuff related to all this too. Um, so given that, given that it seems to be that in order to have a meaningful container, you need something like, you know, an entity in a field and a relationship yes. between um, yeah. How do we think of non-duality, which would seem to dissolve the the distinction between entity and field, and how can that be meaningful by that definition? Yeah, and so um, I think one of I consider, uh, and of course, our own self evaluations are very poor judges, uh, but I consider it one of my sort of significant realizations of last year, especially when I was um, at Respond in the monastic academy and mm. interacting with on one end the buddhist monks who are asking me some really profound questions about my approach and other teachers and out of that uh dialoguing with both groups and then setting up a dialogue with them that eventually gets became dialectical and even got into some uh deal dialogos for me um but was this idea um so one of the things that relevance realization is intrinsically interested in is itself, because it is a self-organizing, autopoetic thing and a self-correcting thing. And it's a right. And in, in, in the way in which life is inherently interested in itself or it's not a living thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so I want to I want to understand this very. And of course, moments of insight show that exact thing. OK, so given that. Um, you can then conceive, I think. I'm still playing with this, and so I'm happy to hear what your mm-hmm. response. I really am. Well, I'm happy to hear your response about, <laughs> about everything, but this in particular, too, um, right? Um, relevance realization can come to the realization that it is itself irrelevant. Hmm. You can come to a place where you get the most completely systematic, systemic, not an insight into this problem or even this family of problems, but the insight into a problem into a problematic way of being. And then you can come to realize that that way of I, 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 that, that way of comporting oneself to reality and, and and creating a network by which reality has to be disclosed to you mm-hmm. can itself be irrelevant. And mm-hmm. then the question is, when might it be irrelevant? And then here's a convergence from, from many, many different traditions. Um, when you're trying to relate to being or the ground of being and not to any individual beings, the thing you most importantly must not do, and we were just doing it a f- minute ago, is think of being as a kind of being mm-hmm. and you have to move into this non being non thingy way and you have to enter into a relationship and the only way you can enter into right relationship and resonance with that is to drop all of the relevance realization machinery mm-hmm. that is trying to deal with uh, yeah that now now see this is very interesting because i I, I, so I like that a lot, but then it raises some really profound questions that gets exactly at sort of this, you know, what direction should we orient ourselves to? Because one of the 
uh, pr- difficulty internal struggles I've always had with sort of a, a more classical Buddhist approach to, let's say, mysticism is this, uh, as I interpret it, as being this need to basically, um, you know, again, it, reject the world, uh, its illusion. It's, yes, uh, yes. And, 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 yeah, yeah. and so basically, I'll put it this way, in a Buddhist framing, in a classical Buddhist framing, it seems like the way that you uh, give up the relevance uh, uh, realization machinery is to stop caring about your own agent arena relationship to basically give up and be like uh, nothing essentially matters. So it becomes a form of nihilism. And this is a classic critique, right? So nihilism in short could be a way you could experience this, but I am very personally antithetical to that. I want to be like, no, 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 no. Then we're getting at, we're, we're regressing. We're moving back through the complexity. We're we're giving up on the world. Whereas I want to, in a kind of Nietzschean fashion, affirm the world and say, yes, experience, yes, relevance, realization. Right. But I, can't i don't know how this works at the other end because i can see how nihilism could get you there but i don't see what the total affirmational uh kind of the what is the zenith of relevance realization look like in such a way that the whole machinery uh disappears does that make sense as a question yeah it does yeah. I, I, it, it's excellent and and this is again where the zen neoplatonic tonos is very powerful and it, you get it um in i think nishitani's interpretation of uh, how Zen can respond to Nietzschean doubt. I mean, just think about how, just just let that sit in your mind for a second. Uh, Zen and Nietzsche, and putting them into a deep reciprocal reconstruction, and the uh, and the and, and, and Nishitani's thesis that it, that nihilism is 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 a kind of doubting that has not gone deep enough, mm-hmm. um, right? Uh, and that if you go deeper. It undermines itself, or his one of his book. It, it's a self overcoming of it, uh, and, and then it, and so, and this is where the bottom and the top. I would argue, you realize their their at one minute, um mm-hmm. in a profound way, um, and and so w- I think that that realization is not the point. <laughs> I've argued this. I've published this. I think the 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 realization of this sort of profound resonant at one minute um, is not the point any any more than the 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 sort of pure consciousness event is the point. Mm-hmm. And I, I I've crafted the argument that the pure consciousness event is when you do that scaling down practice as much as you can, yeah. and the resonant at one minute is when you do the scaling up. And the point is not the poles. The point is the polarity. Mm, I like that. I well, and this then brings back this question of integrating the ascent and the descent. Um, yes, totally. Yeah, totally. Because that it seems like it, it is like the life experience is this continual, um, uh, you know, um, uh, opponent processing in a sense that we're that that, that we're moving yes. back between these two things, and then we're getting more attuned. Uh, we're getting a better optimal grip. But it does seem to then affirm being in the world as being sort of the, um, I don't want to say the point of the poles, but there's something about like, if we're not aiming for one pole or the other, we're kind of attuning ourselves to the world by means of the poles. Then it does seem to put the emphasis back on the world itself. And it should be. Uh, and, and again, this is where Zen is helpful in critiquing the perfectionism that you find in Plato, like Zen. Before I studied Zen, mountains were mountains, rivers were rivers. When I studied Zen, mountains weren't mountains and rivers weren't rivers. And then when I was done Zen, mountains were mountains and mm-hmm. rivers were rivers. And yeah. you can only make the difference with intonation or, you know, the, 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 the point of the Socratic project is the good life, mm-hmm. right? And this is Hado's argument, right? And it's not, it's not some ultimate experience or proposition or theoretical claim it's that and th- and this is where the stoicism with within neoplatonism needs to be more properly emphasized mm. we forget neoplatonism is you integrate platonism aristotelianism and stoicism mm-hmm. together and, and 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 stoicism you know really emphasizes you do all this stuff but if it doesn't make you more virtuous throw it away yeah. because the only thing that is intrinsically valuable is a virtuous life 
Well, then question about this, too, because um, so there's so in the history of Neoplatonism, of course, it, it, it gets uh, very powerfully syncretized with the Christian tradition. And then you basically get yes. this uh, association of the of the Neoplatonic one with God, <laughs> you know, and then you get yes, sort of the yes. the Empyrean and you're heading towards the beatific vision, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there's also this notion then that when you die in a Christian context uh, and you go to heaven, you go up to God, that that is then somehow you are then being subsumed into the one i guess there's something like that that there because of that correlation there's sort of a uh and 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 in the christian tradition because basically there is only one life that you get and then you die and then there's an eternity afterwards that is sort of where that leads at the other time at the on the other side of the coin though there's a deep tradition of reincarnation or transmigration in the platonic tradition in the eastern yeah. tradition mystical traditions um uh, even you know socrates himself at the at his um in the apology, right? He's like, look, it's not such a bad thing to die. And uh, there's a lot of like uh, oh, resonances, deep resonances between like the Bhagavad Gita and, uh, and, and stuff that Socrates is talking about, which again, speaks to that. I think that lingua franca that you talk about of the, of the kind of mystical tradition that all being said, these are sort of metaphysical uh, beyond this. Um, well, there are two of, worlds. Two, it really is. But yeah. yeah. So then the question is, what do we do with those? Do we, uh, is there any, can we find value in thinking about um, life after death, either transmigration? It, it, can we value life by seeing a kind of not maybe in a Nietzschean recurrence, eternal recurrence of the same, but, you know, rather than trying to escape samsara, maybe samsara and the eternal cycle is what it's all about, because that's where the process is of of affirming yeah. life and moving through this. Um, so I don't know. Can you say a little bit about um, the one God death afterlife uh, go? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> right. yeah, that, that, uh, yeah, no, no problem. No problem. Yeah, right. You have yeah, two um, minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on the first thing, uh, when you read uh, the Christian Neoplatonists, uh, especially Aquinas and Maximus, um, something is re-emphasized that that story that you told, and I acknowledge that's a common trope within many strands of Christianity. It's one I grew up with, but you get the emphasis is like, no, no, that is not what is being promised to you. And mm -hmm. of course, Origen got into trouble because he tried yeah. to bring the Platonic reincarnation right. and this model together. And it's like, no, what's actually promised to you is the resurrection of the body. And just sit with that for a minute. And the resurrection of the body is some kind of development, completion. I don't want to use that word, but also just say development of uh, the incarnation, uh, which is just a, a, a way in which that eminence emergence thing comes into, you know, uh, the suchness of a particular human life. Um, and all of this is, it, 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 talking about any of this, of course, is incredibly controversial within Christian domain, and I'm probably offending uh, many people. I'm, so I'm asking for some charity here just to try and say this notion of the resurrection of the body isn't just some um, simple, it, like it, it's, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, I, I think it's fair to say whatever you're, wherever you're coming at this from, it is a profound ontological thing. It is not just your personal survival. It's saying that embodiment is central. In fact, um, Aquinas, I can't remember one place sort of criticizes Augustine of saying, like, what, like, why do we, why do we need bodies in your view? We're sort of sort of dragging these bodies around and we're like, well, we should just be right. And it's like, no, um, the resurrection of the body. Now, uh, many Christians take that uh, to be uh, sort of a historical uh, literal event that you could sort of film on a uh, video camera or something like that. I I don't uh, for various reasons that we won't go into here. But what I can say is even people who probably did hold that, like Maximus and Aquinas, don't emphasize that. They emphasize right that resurrection of the body is in some important sense already starting here now. Um, and so I think there is even within the Christian Neoplatonic tradition, strong argument to pull us away from a two worlds mythology and how that also gets us into sort of a ghost going to uh, a permanent recreation park. Uh, uh, and I'm being a little bit contemptuous because um, these authors are, because they rightly point out that view of thing is so incredibly egocentric. Mm. 
Mm. Uh, like it, it's it's based on the presupposition there's something about me that deserves to be in existence forever and then i like the quote from moby dick by the 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 preacher like what is man that he should tr- live out the lifetime of his god like mm. that's an unreasonable proposal uh, uh, so yeah. first of all yeah. i'll stop here but that's my response to that side of things i haven't yeah. talked about yeah. the other side but you you want to say something so well, please just briefly well no why don't you keep going i'd be curious to see what you'd say to the, the other side of things so uh the idea that um uh, that samsara is nirvana and nirvana is samsara void is uh form is emptiness emptiness is form is considered one of the pivotal realizations mm-hmm. of uh, the Zen tradition, um, and in that sense, it ultimately tries to profoundly undermine a two worlds mythology. Uh, I, 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 I think that is completely fair to say. Yeah, the people who who impose a two worlds mythology on Zen haven't gone through the great doubt, mm. haven't taken it deep enough, um, and and this is also this is also aligned with if you see the Buddha on the road, kill him. Right, even empty Nargajunas, even emptiness is empty. Right, and like uh, the attempt to uh, create two worlds mythologies out of this is right is constantly, explicitly undermined within the Zen tradition. Mm -hmm. Now, do I think that they've got complete answers to this issue? No, but I've pointed to two, you know, profoundly important traditions within the Christian and the Zen uh, framework. Right, the the Christian Neoplatonic framework and the Zen framework that both speak to undermining in a profound way um, the two worlds mythology. Yeah, no, and I I agree with all that, but it does raise here's a here's a question. Um, it's like when people say, you know, oh man, I death means that my life doesn't matter, or uh, the fact that you know, uh, or even at a bigger scale, oh, the, the the idea that there will be a thermodynamic heat death of the entire universe and everything, all matter will eventually disappear, means that nothing matters. And I know that in the past you've talked about saying like, well, no, that's you're, you're misconstruing the agent arena relationship. None of that is relevant right. to you. It's not meaningful, therefore. And so, uh, you know, you're, 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 uh, it's a maladaptive response to that sort of uh, uh, yeah, way yeah. of thinking. At the same time, uh, it's a very real way in which people come face to face with nihilism and with meaninglessness. Yeah. And so um, there's a part of me that wants to uh, understand those kinds of orientations within a broader agent arena framework. It seems like having the biggest map possible of the arena is a meaningful thing and trying to situate yourself in relationship yes. to that. It would then for, therefore, you know, be a meaningful thing in some way. And I think that I I'm the more I'm thinking about these things, the more I'm coming to construe really religion uh, as being about that, trying to, trying to yes. get the, the, the total encompassing map so that you have that arena so that you know, what's meaningful and relevant. Um, and so anyway, to, to tie this into what we were just talking about, uh, I think that people have a meaningful apprehension of uh, of death and of their own dissolution. And I and there's a part of me that wants to see that as, um, you know, not just sort of, a, OK, we'll get over it because it's ultimately irrelevant, uh, but somehow kind of integrate that into, yeah. you know, something yeah. meaningful. And again, I think narrative can can be part of that. Um, but yeah, so I guess what I'm getting at is, uh, or to, to try to home, you know, converge this yeah. towards a question, um, you know, is there something that we therefore can, or even ought to relate to that is beyond ourselves, uh, that even while we can acknowledge the dissolution of our own ego at, at our death, and, and that's not what it's all about, we can still find a meaningful relationship to the continuance of the universe, the continuance of the arena, the continuance of others, something that does make uh, that uh, problem for people, uh, you know, ameliorate it in a, in a helpful way. Well, that's exactly what mattering is. This is why I've been sort of posing this question to person when they to people when they ask me, "What's what do you mean by meaning in life?" And I ask, "What do you want to continue existing, even when you don't? And how are you currently making a difference to it?" And if they have good answers to those questions, I predict that they find that a lot of meaning in life. Mm-hmm. So that's exactly it. The, and then the next part is here's where Zen can help the Neoplatonism. Zen. Uh, in fact, the Buddhist tradition does a lot to make you experience immortality as something horrific. And uh, so, for example, do you want to live forever? Well, oh, yeah, of course, of course. Well, all your friends are going to die, all your family. Oh, they have to live forever, too. At what age? 
at what age? And what about all the people? Then they need a whole bunch of people to live forever. And they'll, oh my gosh, I need everybody to live forever. And then how is that going to work? And then I need there not to be sort of change and entropy within in the earth because all the people are dependent. So the, all the living things have to like, uh, uh, and, and, and then you realize I'm trying to freeze reality. And that's absolutely horrific. Mm. Right. Yeah. And then when you, re- and then, and then the idea is you, you let the, the horror you cultivate. It's a practice. You cultivate the horror to the point where, right. You, 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 it counterbalances that yeah. innate. I want to live forever. Or you do imagine me living forever and all of my failures and vices being given unlimited time to develop and grow and you go oh Mm. oh that's horrific yeah right and so the point is you get people to say do you really want immortality and if you get them and then you say did that did letting go of that desire undermine the meaning in life you have right now and i don't mean conceptually i mean experientially and they'll they'll very frequently say no it somehow enhances it yeah that's right that's right yeah um Fascinating. I, so I know you've got to go. Uh, and I this has been great. I really appreciate this. Um, uh, it, there's so many more things I'd love to dig into. I mean, what the last thing I'll just say is I wonder uh, if there's a meaningful way that we could uh, preserve or reimagine that beatific vision that is important to, uh, yes. you know, neo yeah. Uh, platonic christian traditions and and, and you know I, there's a part of me that is in love with the final cantos of dante's paradiso if we could somehow <laughs> yeah, do yeah. that forever uh, yeah, i could i yeah. could get behind that so i'd be one i'd be curious to see how we could integrate that well into, you'll, you'll yeah. just have to have me back on your uh, on your show if you want brendan you are we'll... the, it's an open invitation but yeah maybe we can do another conversation uh, yeah let's let, uh, why don't we maybe like two or three in, in oh, a series i, I generally great. like not only long form within a video, but long form between videos like we did sure. before. Yeah. And so, yeah, please reach out uh, to, to Madeline and we'll sure. set up a time and we'll make it happen. Awesome. This was wonderful. This yeah. was really wonderful. Likewise. Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate it. Have a wonderful rest oh, of your day. Oh, this was great. We'll I really touch. enjoyed it. Uh, cool. And I, I look forward to talking with you again. Sounds great. All right. We'll be in touch. Take care, my okay. friend. You too. Bye-bye.